to the Bruin family. Uh, Pat, uh, your mom, Patsy, is that right? So she's not doing well. And, uh, you know, here's your two daughters that take care of their mama and been bringing her in, looking after her. Now look at Donna here and, and her mother, uh, Janie, who we've known forever. A man who's 88, who is, and these are moms of the house, I'd call them, you know. And, and uh, it's so important when their lives are, and, and here's what I want to say to, you, to, all, to all three of you is this. You've done everything you can. You've been good daughters. You, you've, been, you've been good to, to mama, you know. And we beat ourselves up, and I know this as one who's lost his dad. We beat ourselves up too much, and we, I want you to be released in such a way to understand that there's so much about your moms. And, you know, and I look around, I see Sister Hicks. I, I know there are other uh, mamas here in the house. But these are the two that really need our prayers right now. And not only them, but pray for the daughters. Amen. Pray for the family, the connections. And I appreciate the love that's in this house. But we, we have to continue this because what, what makes uh, our church, our church is our connections. That we're connected to one another. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned Sam, somebody came out. Adam came out yesterday with his wife and rode the property, which was my daughter's former boyfriend. Now, when you got a connection where a former boyfriend or your daughter can show up and you give them permission without taking them into the woods and shooting them, amen, that, that's, that's a good thing. You know, and he was, he was very kind in thanking me that I allowed him to ride around the property. These are connections we've made over years and years when we, we continue to do this. And, and it's so powerful to have that and how that we do it. And so this morning, we'll talk to you about kingdom connections. And, and we're in a kingdom. It ain't just, we're not just going to heaven. Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And heaven is a kingdom. Jesus came to earth to establish a kingdom. And we, don't, we struggle with that as Americans because we're all rebels and, you know, we kicked anything that had to do with a king or a queen out of here. But the understanding of kingdom is biblical interpretation. You catch hold of the kingdom, you start understanding Jesus came here to establish a kingdom. He sent us as ambassadors. I told you for years, you were sent here. You weren't just born here, you were sent here. God thought about you. And this is important. God thought you were a thought in the mind of God before God put you into a womb to get you here. Uh, Psalm 139 bears that out. All through Scripture, we start reading where you know, Jesus used the phrase over and over again, I was sent, I was sent, I was sent. And, and well, no, I thought you were born. No, I was sent here. I, I'm here on purpose for a time. I will leave a, de a legacy, but until then, I have a destiny to fulfill. And when you start getting that mindset, and it's a mindset. I can't convince the whole world of this, but surely, eventually, I can get somebody in this church to believe it. That the mindset is that we're from the, another place, that God put us here, and, and we're visiting this planet. And one day, we're, that's why I have this idea about going all the time, about leaving and enjoying life while I'm here. I, there's nothing here that I, and I look at my stuff, and your stuff will hold you if you're not careful. Be careful of all your stuff. You know, I, I want to be able to use my stuff and release my stuff and let other people use it. And, and when I'm gone, I'm gone. Again, we've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. Never seen one with a luggage track on it. When you go, you go. And, and I don't want to be mean, but I, I, I oftentimes, hundreds and hundreds of times, I stood before the coffin with the people that come up, and we're so attached to people that we love that are leaving us, and we'll look at them and say, go ahead and let that diamond ring and that gold necklace and all all that stuff, just go ahead and leave it in the coffin. I love y'all. But as soon as y'all walk away, I take it. No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I've never done that, never, ever, ever, ever done that in my life. But I will tell you this, I, that, that funeral director, he'll watch me. He'll watch me because I'm watching him. If they say leave it in the coffin, leave it in the coffin. I'll watch because that's my job, make sure he does his job. And shut the lid down and leave, it, leave that $5,000 ring in that, in that coffin, in that $30,000 coffin that cost a family that don't have a dollar to their name. They feel guilty about that, what they did in life. Oh, well, I, I, I didn't even mean my sermon at all. I'm just trying to tell you guys, when we leave this world, we leave this world. Amen. And what we got is, you know, it's going to be given over to somebody else. Make sure you have a, in your wheel to who it's going to go to. So they're not fighting over it and messing with it and, you know, and all that. So it's just got to be wise with things like that. But connections. Everybody say connections. 
So important. Solomon was a, a young man. At, I read about Solomon again this morning. I read where the Queen of Sheba came. Brought 8,000, over 8,000 pounds of gold to him. She brought spices to him. He, she sat among him and said, he's the wisest man I've ever been around. What a wise guy. He, and, of course, he's David's son from Bathsheba. And as we move down the line, he dies. And after he dies, there's a fight over his stuff. And everybody's fighting, and Rehoboam's fighting over it, and Jeroboam's fighting over it. Everybody's rising up. Well, there's this one guy. Let's go to 1 Kings. Are you comfortable? Chapter 12. We find this guy named Rehoboam. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He, Solomon said, I'll kill you, and he took off, you know, the rules. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and his whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, I know this gets a little confusing, your father put a heavy yoke on us, the old king, but now lighten the harsh labor. And they, the heavy yoke he put on us, and we're, we're going to serve you. And Rehoboam answered, go away for three days, and then come back to me. So the people went away. The king Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. And how would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. If you'll be a servant, they'll be a servant. Jesus taught us this, to serve one another. So the elders give him this, this answer and share this with him. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him. And consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. Listen, there's a difference in having a father, a mother, a spiritual father and mother counsel you than to have one of your brothers counsel you or have one of your sons or daughters in the faith counsel you. You see, he asked the elders what they thought. They said, you serve, they'll serve you. Your counsel is so important where you get your counsel from. One of my problems with the, we're not just the body of Christ, but people in general, we do things without counsel. But we want to ask the counsel of somebody that's going to give us a favorable opinion. Instead of asking somebody straight up, how do you really look at this? And th this is important because we all got these itchy ears. We all scratch about stuff. I had a man get mad and leave the church a couple weeks ago, just found out about this. And it happens. It's happened in my life for 26 years. People get upset and laugh. But I had to ask the question, well, why, why is he upset? She said, well, you, uh, the man told me, he said, well, when I was with him, I found out that he was upset with you, Pastor, because of what you said, the counsel you gave from the pulpit. Some of you might remember this. My counsel was do not live unequally yoked. Don't be unequally yoked. Do not, the Scripture says in Deuteronomy, do not plow with a donkey and a heifer. Right? Because they run at different speeds. And I know I said the word jackass, and I know that bothered some people, but that's the Bible. Anyway, so, so, so this girl in our church, in other, other campus, she kicked him out of the house. She said, you heard the preacher. He said, a hell from a jackass can't get along together. So he mad at me. Left the church. That's some terrible counsel, isn't it? Uh, and then he said, uh, and then, then I'll call always the next one is, and he's always talking about money. I always hear that from people. You ought to go to a church that talks about money. This church don't talk a lot about money, but I need to start doing a little bit more. Because it ain't about us, it's about you. It's about you. Forgiveness is not about the one you're forgiven. It's about you being forgiven. Amen. You've you got to get this thing right. So anyway, I, I like that out. In other words, you need to love each other, love God, love each other as you move through life. And if you've got a difference, then there's always going to be a problem. But anyway, counsel. So, so he had counsel from the elders. The elders said, serve and you'll be served. The young people, they began to say different things to him. So the young men who had grown up with him replied, you know what? And these are them prima donna, uh, uh, little wealthy, uh, silver spoon kids. That, that, you know, the son is, is the son of a king. And we're, we're all princes of other, uh, others. So. He said, tell these people who have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make your yoke lighter. Tell them my little finger's thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, and I'll make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I'll scourge you with scorpions, metal spikes on leather leashes. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. 
He followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I'm going to make it heavier. The father scourged you with whips. I'll scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people for the return of events was, uh, was from the Lord to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through a hide of the, the Shilonite. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel, look after your own house, O David. So the Israelites went home. I know it's a lot to read here. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam sent out Adarium, who was in charge of forced labor, but all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get in his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. He got on out of there. He kind of, uh, well, that was a smart move, right, wasn't it? We got more. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for connections. We thank you for the elders. We thank you for the wise. God, we ask you to give us wisdom as we move into kingdom connections and understand the gifts and callings in our own life. And Lord, again, I lift up uh, Sister Brune. I lift up uh, 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 Janie to you. I lift up their lives. They've been so important to us in this house. We pray for peace. We pray for comfort. We pray, God, your will in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. You know, when I look at people, whether they be leaders or just people taking care of their families, they have one thing in common. They connect with people. And this was what David did. David connected with people. Solomon connected with people. And then here comes Rehoboam, and he, he's not connected. He, he did take the advice of the elders. He, did, he took the advice of those around him. And, and this is important. Your opinion has to matter to somebody. And, I, and listen again. Advice given that is not solicited always comes across as criticism. When you give advice to someone and they didn't ask for it, I don't even care if it's your kids. They'll look at you like you are criticizing them. I always like to wait and I wait on them. When somebody finally asks me, which they're really saying to me is my opinion matters. So now I'm going to share with you. Connecting with people is not an option in life. we got to connect. Everybody say connect. Some of my favorite games are connect for. Another game I've played with my kids my, my, our whole lives is tic-tac-toe. And that's connecting the, the X's or the O's. And, the, and when you connect, you win. Everybody say connect. Yeah. I win. As long as I'm connected, I'm going to win. If we don't connect with the people, we will not be able to influence them effectively. I ask myself all the time, is there, any, is there anyone, is there someone who can better pastor the little country churches? And that's not an easy answer. It's not an easy answer unless I know that God has called me and placed me and I continually serve to connect. As long as I'm connecting, then I feel like, okay, I belong here. The moment I don't connect to people no more, then I think, okay, God, you need to raise up somebody else and put them in my place because I'm not connect. Connection is important. Amen. To have those connections. Rehoboam never connected with people. His life showed him it is impossible for a leader to connect with people while pursuing selfish ends. If you're after your own things, if you're after wanting to do what you want to do in life, you're not going to connect with others. Rehoboam was, was power hungry. Amen. He was more concerned about flexing his political muscle than connecting with his people. And even when the Israelites promised to follow him, we'll follow you. If you serve, we'll serve. We'll follow you to the ends. But if you, if you keep making our, our burdens heavier and heavier, what can we do? By nature, connecting is a given experience. When you connect with people, let me be honest, it's going to cost you. It's always going to cost you. It costs your time. It costs your talent. It costs your energy. Sometimes it costs your sustenance, but it costs you. But that's okay. That's what connecting is supposed to do in life. Loyalty, loyalty is the measuring stick of love. You never know how much somebody loves you until they're loyal to you. And when they're loyal to you and they stick with you and they stay with you, that's why in my life I look back and you saw the friends in my life have more than compensated for any failures that I've had. Amen. They've come along beside me and, and showed me what it means. Ecclesiastes 4 9 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him. Understand that 18, 19 years of age, when I first read this, it just, it, it, it infused inside of me. It excited me. It helped me understand that two are better than one. And it wasn't just talking about marriage. It was talking about friendship. It was talking about connection, being connected with somebody. And if I can find somebody, and, and listen, God never called you to be a lone wolf. Oh, we Americans, we love to be lone wolves. We like to be rebels. We like to be, here I go again on my own. 
That was me on a Harley yesterday. Amen. But I had another bike next to me. You know, I, don't, I like the song, but the truth is I like to have other people with me. I like social. I like connecting like that. So if one falls down, this is the strength of two people. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and there's nobody else there to help him up. You know, it's the banana that leaves the bunch that always gets peeled. You got to stay in the bunch. You got to stay together. The modern church does not always place a high value on relationships. While the New Testament commands us in 1 Peter 1.22, fervently love one another from the heart. We have developed a cold corporate culture. We're content to, to herd people into buildings for services and then herd the people out. Our main concern is that they occupy a seat and they listen to a sermon. But did they connect? Did they connect? You know, I, I've been involved with churches that, that do this, and I'm not, I'm not, I, don't, I don't always have the answer. But I do know the answer is this, relationships. Building relationships within the house. You can have a cliques in this house. That's fine. But you can't have schisms. A schism is somebody always trying to divide others. But there'll always be cliques. Twelve disciples, 70 disciples, Peter, James, and John, the real tight disciples with Jesus. There's always going to be those people you get along the most with. Amen. They're interest oriented. You connect with them well, whether it be through age, it be through uh, lifestyle, something about them. Amen. You got a ponytail. He got a ponytail. Look at y'all. Y'all sitting up here together with ponytails. There's just something about it. But, but only a fraction of people in most churches even get involved. They don't, get, they, they don't connect. They don't, they, they don't work with each other. So personally, I don't believe we will see New Testament revival power or New Testament impact until we reclaim a fervent New Testament love. And that is to connect with one another, adjust my life to be able to help somebody else's life. My hope is that as we as a family connect to groups of interest, as we start moving this week, we'll have a Tuesday night service here. I pray it means something to you. We haven't had one all summer. I pray Tuesday night you're here. Amen. I pray Wednesday night the, the New Caney campus shows up. I also pray you look back at that board and say, okay, where do I want to connect this month? And each month, that's going to change some. We're going to have a skeet shoot over at Steve and, and, and Jamie's house for the men. The ladies are going to be gathered at Los Compadres. This, this, you know, and then not only that, you've got your lift meetings. And you've got, you got Sister Diane. She's getting a group together for a, a, a conference this, this month. We've got so many things. We've got SWAT going on with seniors that can get together. There's a lot kind of things that are going to be happening. Speeding and a bunch of off-road mutters are going to get together. When I said off-road mutters, I'm not talking about old women, okay? I'm talking about uh, uh, trucks with, with four-wheel drives, okay? Uh, they, they're going to get together. The round table's getting together. The designs of the motorcycle groups are getting These are, are, are good opportunities to connect. Amen. And if we don't connect, we'll stay separate. I mean, you can come to church, just leave, come to church. I understand that. You and me can do that. But the bottom line is I'm always going to be pushing for people to connect. Reasons we don't develop and we don't connect, self-centeredness. Self-centered. Jesus defined love when he said, greater love has no one than this, is that one man lay down his life for his friends. Friendship is powerful. Real friendship is always sacrificial. We tend to want friendship on our terms. We want to be loved and encouraged and comforted. But if we want that kind of love, we should be willing to give it to someone else first. Say reciprocate. Boy, did I learn that word. Reciprocation, always coming back around. Again, there are two types of people will always be in your life. There will be connections or, or attachments. Some folk will attach, and they'll stay attached to you, and you don't know if they're a connection yet. You're always trying to pick them up. You're always trying to help understand that. There are some folk, bless your heart, they'll always be attached to you. You're cheering. And you can't help that. That's just, that's just life. But what you want is connections. You want something that reciprocates, flows back in. You loved, they loved. You cared, they cared. Amen. You reached out, they reached out. You served, they served. It became a reciprocate. And it's so easy to be around those people. They're high impact, low maintenance. They're just fun to be around. You know they're going to take care of things. They're going to look after stuff. That's the kind of people you want in your life. Amen. You don't want attachments to stay in your life. Attachments, my friend, they're like a vacuum cleaner. They will suck the life out of you. They come along as if somehow they're Eureka. But they're not. they dirt devils. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. you got to watch for them. you got to be careful of that. It'll, it'll take life clearly from you. The British preacher Charles Spurgeon said, Any man can selfishly desire to have a Jonathan. 
But he is on the right track who desires to find a David to whom he can be a Jonathan. It's important to have that connection to find somebody I'm connected to that I like. Bitterness can stop you from having friends. Oh, my goodness. Bitter people are bitter. Now, that's a revelation. Sire. Sire. That sounded country, didn't it? Sire. Sour. Two syllables. Paul told the Ephesians in, in chapter 3, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. When he said that to the Ephesians, and you've got to catch this, Ephesus was a, a seaport. It was a place of, of prostitution, wickedness, immorality, abu abuse. I know what happened in Texas yesterday. I talked to my pastor about it again. It's like every time I come to church, so there's been another shooting. What well, we have forgotten because we have this idea that America is a peaceful place. So when stuff like this happens, it rocks our world. It, it, it shakes us to the core. In other countries, this happens daily. I'm not trying to justify our nation. It's, there's some wickedness that happens. But in other countries, there are people being blown up. There, there are folk walking into churches, destroying one another. There's nationalities fighting and clashing against one another. There are, they've never been at peace for hundreds of years. And we do. We, this is bad. I'm not trying to, to demean and put this down. But listen, it's a spiritual problem. And until we get the right connections, and we still start connecting with the loners and try to help pull people out and try to help them in their time of need, and I know we can't help everyone, but there are times I'll see certain kids I reach out to because I don't want that kid to be a shooter. I don't want that kid to be wicked. I don't want that kid to get mad at others. I don't want to see another school shooting, another Walmart, anything else on the road. I, but, but my whole life, I've seen this. It's a spiritual problem. And again, it's not taking something away from people. It's giving somebody something. If I can give you Jesus, I promise you it change your life. You'll start loving life again. What does a nation do that has no respect for life? That kills millions of babies over the last, uh, uh, since 1973. Millions and millions and millions of babies. Throws them out, kills them. And acts like somehow that that life doesn't matter. And then we get upset when somebody else takes somebody's life. Our nation is skewed. Either life matters or it doesn't. Let's get back to bitterness here real quick. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Many believers today have never let go of their resentments. They don't realize that people who, who, who uh, seethe with anger over past hurts poison themselves and make it impossible to develop close friends. I have, I've had people I have loved and bitterness seep into their life. And whether I cause it or somebody else cause it, but it ruins friendship. It takes it away. Bitterness will make you unfriendly, and people will avoid you because you are toxic. You are toxic. It's something about your voice, when you talk, everything you say, there's toxicity to it. We must learn to pay close attention to our hearts and purge any grudge the instant it begins to take root in our souls. Uh, next one, low self-esteem. Jesus told us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Love your neighbor. Everybody say love your neighbor. Mm, somebody said it ain't in the Bible. Good fences make great neighbors. <laughs> that ain't in the Bible. Good fences. I got good fences make great neighbors. Uh-uh. Listen, I, I thank God that uh, over the years that we reached, my neighbors were on the platform today. You know, there's something about connecting with your neighbors. And when he said neighbors, he means neighbors. I know some say neighbors mean somebody way down in Mexico. Me, me, I love somebody way down. No, it means the one next door to you. Amen, the one with the yappy dog? I'm that neighbor. <laughs> Not my fault. Hello. But the bottom line is neighbors. Love your neighbors yourself. That, that's talking about, that's about esteem. When I, I can't love my neighbor if I don't love me. I got to love me. Yeah, I, I got to appreciate me. I got to thank God for me. There's some bad things in my life, always has been, but there's some good things too. So I got to look at the good things and say, you know what? I got to love me. Y'all remember my little granny used to say to me, I love me, I love me, I'm wild about myself. I'm not teaching you to be arrogant, but I am teaching you to love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, nobody else can love you. I can't help you if you don't love you. You got to love you. Amen. At least like yourself. Amen. 
It's important. Low self-esteem. Uh, our, our love for others is short-circuited when we don't think we have anything to offer in a relationship. Many people lack the confidence to reach out and make friends because they don't think that we deserve to be loved. If I've reached out to them, I don't deserve I do deserve it. You have to get yourself into that place and start reaching out to others. Self-hatred can be caused by abuse, lack of parental affection, bullying, or other factors. And if you struggle to love yourself, you've got to be willing to crawl up out of that and say, to you, I, I, look, if God loved me, I can love. If God cares for me, then I can care. Amen. Reach out to people around you. God's prepared you for it. He wants you to connect. Fear of rejection. Oh, man, what if they reject me? What if they don't? Oh, what do they do? What if they, what if they don't like me? Amen. What, what if, what if, what, and we get this what ifs in our life, and that what if is, is uh, something that holds us back, that rejection there. I meet people who have given up on church altogether because they felt they were betrayed. Some have even left ministry positions because friends turned their backs on them. Their, their, their attitude is, I, I will never let anyone hurt me like that again. But is it really worth it to close the door on the possibility of friendship just because of one or two bad experiences? Proverbs 4, 18, 24 says, Friends come and friends go, but a true, true friend sticks by you like family. The loyal friends in my life, they have compensated for so many disappointments that I have made. Friendship is worth the risk taken. It's, you've got to reach out. See, if we're going to make connections work, we're going to see the kingdom work in this house, we've got to make friends. And I have found that a friend got to show himself friendly. Uh, I hear this all the time when people visit this church. That's the friendliest church I've ever been around. I'm sorry, they were talking about that other bunch. <laughs> Don't let me down. Amen. We, we're the same church here. Well, amen. There's something about being friendly. There's something about making those connections. I don't want to be get to the place where people are hurted in and hurted out. I want to see folk make connections. I want you to hurt when other people hurt. Cry when other people cry. I want you to laugh when they laugh. But if that kid's in the hospital, it concerns you. If somebody you loved in this house, you know, uh, when I did a funeral, I did a funeral a couple weeks ago in, in Pam. I looked around, there's a bunch of church folk there for your mom. Because most of her friends had died. That's so important that we family. And if we miss that, we might as well shut the doors. Because we're missing out the whole thing about Christianity and what Jesus came to do. So, Pastor, what, what do we do about it? First, get beyond yourself. I love you, but none of us are all that. Get beyond yourself. People who fail to get beyond themselves are usually themselves selfish, insecure, or both. Rehoboam was caught up with the advice he got from his, his brothers, amen, and the sons in his life. He didn't listen to his elders. He, he, did. They gave a, he asked for an opinion, but he wanted somebody else's opinion. He didn't get beyond himself. Rehoboam got into an attitude where he thought he was all that. He was caught up in the limelight of his position. He was just put in that position because he was born into it. But now he's all that. And he thought his bullying would produce more respect, but it only produced contempt and intimidation. To connect with people, you've got to remain other-minded. You've got to remain reminded with them and serve with them. Grow beyond yourself. Amen. Rehoboam was arrogant and unteachable. He missed a great opportunity for growth. He destroyed the nation. All he had to do was serve. All he had, I, I love a, a leader that will serve. There's somebody that will step out and love somebody else, do something for somebody. Now, that to me is something. I've I, I, I got to be behind that kind of leader. I'll get behind that kind of coach. I'll get behind that kind of teacher. But I know it all. A silver spoon that's never worked for anything they got. I can't listen to that. I want to be around somebody that's got to you got to grow beyond yourself. The potential to connect with people is to remain humble and teachable. Bishop Gary is going to be with us in a couple months, Gary McIntosh. And, and he taught me years ago, humility is the position of strength. Not arrogance, but humility. That if I humble myself, that's the strongest I've ever been. Not to bow up and act like I'm over or usurping or being meaner or better than somebody else, but to humble myself. I, and I realize, my goodness, I've, there's certain principles I just never forget. They, they weigh on my heart to stay humble. Be careful with it. So give beyond yourself. People of low self-esteem are almost always preoccupied with themselves. It's important not to learn this. When people give of their time, their talent, their tithe, whatever they have, when they're givers in life, they got a zest for life. They love life. When we hoard, my goodness, we make movie shows out of that. When we hoard, what do we do? We stay with our old magazines. We stay with our old stuff. We don't get out. I'm calling you out. 
if you're able. I, and I know many of you, you've already lived a rich life. And sometimes I'll preach this and you go, Pastor, I'm 90 years old. But I understand, I understand. But I'm getting on the rest of us. Keep getting out. Keep pressing. Keep moving. Go beyond yourself. You've got to make an impact in this life. Amen. The essence of going beyond yourself is having a connection with others that is far-reaching, that you make a difference in the lives of people that you've never met. This week, just through that little Facebook post, people I've never met started contacting me because it was shared into the lives of people that I don't know. And it started coming back to me. And it, this was the thing. You've heard me say it for 16 years. They never heard it. And they said, what a refreshing take on life. To get out and live life. To be holy wild. To get beyond myself. That if I could do that. And so, and so I don't know what's going to happen with that. But it hits me. We got something to give to people. We got a blessing for other people. We got to keep making kingdom connections. Stand with me if you would. The ability to connect is inherent in all of us. Not everyone desires or tries. See, like the quest of my life is trying to get people out of comfort zones. Well, look at your arms. Just reach with your arm around and see if you don't touch somebody. Go ahead. See if you don't. Look at that. You touch somebody. You just connected. And I, I, I'll go so far as to say even those with disabilities who have no arms are still finding ways of touching. Some of the most motivating things, one of the most motivating things I've ever seen was a man with no arms and legs teaching people how to touch others. Wow. I watched a man with no arms and legs coaching a football team in his chair out there on the field coaching a football team. Well, and he was touching. And the kids would come and hug his neck. He just kept touching. And it hits me how many times we got, I, I get frustrated that there are times my legs don't want to move. I slip, I fall, I stumble. Then I get up and I think to myself, I know, I've met, I've witnessed people without legs reaching and touching and not quitting. And it motivates me to keep going in life. I can't just sit back. And I don't care what your heart is, your heartache is. You get too self-centered, you can't connect with other people. You get bitter, you can't connect with other people. You get thinking life is all about you, you can't connect with other people. I'm looking to connect. And I'll constantly stay after this in my heart. It's so important. Uh, many of you, you got such testimonies. I don't want to share your testimony. Maybe you shared on Tuesday about connecting. But I've watched some of you. You were hermits. You were introverted. You, you, you pulled, your attitude was kind of extroverted, but you were introverted. You pulled yourself in. And when you met Jesus, as if you were walking on the water in a night storm, he bid you to walk. And that attitude of yours began to shift. Bitterness began to leave you. Self-centeredness began to leave you. And you started getting out of your boat. And I've watched you walk for years. Stepping and continue. And I will continually believe God for that. I'll believe for our kids to get out and start walking. Now, this wasn't a wave walking sermon, but it's a lot like that, that you would come, that I would see you moving. I see people say, I'll never go to church. The next thing they in church. I don't even like. And then you, you start coming to church here and you find out somebody you don't like is here. Isn't that just like Jesus? Amen. To introduce you, reintroduce you, reconnect you. In life, we got to go beyond ourselves. Get beyond yourself. Grow, 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 grow. Keep growing. Keep giving. Keep going. Father, I thank you for this house of people. Your heads are bowed, your eyes closed. I'm going to ask you an intimate question to you. If you've been away from God, would you put your hand up so I can pray with you? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. See, I felt that. See, this is an important day for you. Those hands lifted up again. We'll pray this together. Lord Jesus, this is my day that things turn around. I refuse to live a life to myself. Forgive me of my sins. I come back to you with an assurance that you take me in. I will get beyond myself. I will grow. I will give. And I will go. I will connect. 
for those around me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now come on, give God a praise. Come on, give him a real praise. When you're reading scripture and you see a, a young man like this guy, Rehoboam, who said, I ain't listening to the elders. I'll listen to that man. I listen to that man. I listen to the elders in this. I listen to that man. There are people in your life you need to listen to. You need to get around. Don't be. And you say, well, that wasn't the advice I wanted. Well, why did they give you that advice? Did they give you that advice out of fear? Did they give you that advice out of love? And at times when somebody looks at you and they just give you, I, I continually give advice to those who ask me, and particularly my kids. I'm just waiting on that asking, and I'm going to give my advice to tell you what I think. And I'm reading about Solomon. This hit me, David. I'm reading about Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, and I thought, God, all of us, not just me, but all of us could be like Solomon. We got the book of Proverbs. Yeah. All of us could be that person that when somebody comes and sits down and begins to ask us or wonder why, that we begin to share wisdom with them. The world needs wisdom. Solomon said, it's better to have wisdom than gold and silver. Mm -hmm. If I'm wise, wisdom can save a lot of pains, aches, and hurts in our life. Amen? Wisdom. Amen. Be seated for a brief moment. David comes up. Our servant leaders come up.